For most of us who use devices from day to day, there are two things that matter most, performance and power. Beyond that, there's the cost and when exactly can I get my hands on it. The topic of power often has two main angles, the peak power consumed and the idle power consumed. Both of those rely on how much voltage is needed to convert the transistors, the switches in the silicon chips inside, from a zero to a one and vice versa. Despite advances in manufacturing and packaging, there has been a fundamental limit in the physics of that zero to one to zero flip. A new research paper from UC Santa Barbara is showcasing breakthrough numbers to help lower the power consumption of anything with a transistor. What's your minimum specification? So a modern computer chip has millions of transistors, or in the case of GPUs, billions, or in the case of wave-scale dinner plates, trillions. This is the Broadha Broadcom Tomahawk 4, and this has billions of transistors. Each transistor is a switch, and there's a power cost to turning it on and off. We often like to think that a switch is a binary one or zero in a very digital-like context, and for the most part, it makes everything we talk about a lot simpler. However, the reality is definitely a bit more analog than that. For this video, we're going to talk about transistor design, the physics of electrons, and there'll be some graphs as well. This is still research, but I'll take you through. Let's start with what we need in a switch. In a standard computer chip, a switch is enabled by allowing electrons to flow between two locations. In order to get electrons to flow, we apply an electric field, attracting electrons to flow through a material. It lowers the energy barrier for those electrons to flow. The barrier is reduced by orders of magnitude due to this applied voltage, and what might be one in a million chance of an electron flowing becomes one in one, six orders of magnitude difference. The voltage to create that electric field that causes the change is where a lot of the power in modern chips comes from, and the key limit to modern chip designs which hasn't changed in over 30 plus years. That limit is given at 60 millivolts per order of magnitude, also known as 60 millivolts per decade. In order to transition those six orders of magnitude, it requires around 360 millivolts, and this is above and beyond the minimum voltage required to get the chip to even function. The reason this exists is due to the fundamental premise of the modern transistor. Modern transistors are also known as MOSFETs, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors. I mentioned that we tried to get electrons to flow between two locations, known as a source and a drain. The voltage is applied through an oxide layer known as a gate. In order to build the transistor in the device, the source and the gate have silicon atoms removed or replaced in a process called doping. You can dope with elements like boron or phosphorus to adjust the structure of the silicon, making it electron rich or electron deficient. In a MOSFET, both source and drain are doped the same way, and then by applying a voltage to this gate, Separated by this oxide, it creates a field that attracts electrons from source to drain. This is a design that has a 60 millivolt per decade limit. One way to represent this electron transport is an energy diagram. In this diagram, we have the standard transistor and the lines indicate the energy level of the electrons. The energy level is more of a spectrum than a line and in order to move from source to gate, you have to give the electrons more energy or reduce the energy requirement to move between them through what we call the channel. In the case of a MOSFET, we reduce the energy barrier of the channel. The new research published in Nature by the research group at UC Santa Barbara has found a way to make the transistor easier to turn on and off, lowering the power requirements. It involves a TFET or tunneling field effect transistor, which isn't a new technology, we'll get to that in a second, but the materials used are new in order to help drive down the power. In a tunneling FET, we build a transistor in a similar way, a source, a channel, a drain, and then a control gate with an oxide. Except this time, instead of doping the source and drain the same way, they are doped with opposite polarity. This means one side of the transistor is electron rich and the other side is electron deficient. It means that the transistor is predisposed to wanting these electrons to flow. However, the barrier between them is either physical with no path or too far for quantum tunneling to actually take place. As perhaps the name implies, 
tunneling FETs work by applying a voltage to the gate that causes electrons to tunnel from one end of the transistor to the other. This is a quantum effect. There's no physical path, but we have electrons ready to move from one side to the other. In order for the electrons to move, we have to talk about the electron energies again. This is the diagram before, where we showed with standard transistors, with the energy hump to get over in order for the electrons to flow. Due to the way tunneling FETs are manufactured, the energy diagram actually looks like this, which might be a little confusing at first, but for those familiar with the technology te terminology, this is a representation of electron bonding and antibonding orbital energies, also known as the electron uh, bands. In order for tunneling to occur, the electron energies need to overlap, such that the electron can transfer from source to drain while staying at the same energy level and conserving energy. When the voltage is applied to the tunneling FET, the energy levels for the electrons in the source and drain move from not overlapping to overlapping, enabling this quantum effect. The energy required to do this is much less than the standard transistor. Again, we previously mentioned this 60 millivolts per decade number, yet in this research paper, with the 2D channel material used, the group were able to represent it at 18 millivolts per decade, a 70% decrease reducing the active voltage for modern processors by 70% would be a sizable improvement in anything from big AI chips down to smartphones and smart devices. Let's cycle back and talk about that channel material. I mentioned it's a 2D material, but what is a 2D material? If you take standard table salt, known as sodium chloride, it naturally forms a large cubic array of sodium ions and chloride ions. The elements used naturally form a large array. Almost every combination of elements outside of organic materials form large arrays. However, there are a few that end up limited with the, which directions they can spread. 2D materials fall into this gap. They can scale in an X and a Y direction, but due to the nature of the elements used, do not scale in the Z direction. One group of two-dimensional materials are called TMDs, which is an acronym for Transition Metal Dicalcogenide. The name isn't important, but these are materials you may have heard me mention before in other videos. Molybdenum disulfide, or MOS2, is one, and tungsten ditelluride, WSE2, is another. These both form 2D materials that kind of look like this. It's a sheet, and yes, if you know anything about nanosheets, this is where nanosheets is going to end up as well. However, in this research paper, 2D materials were used for the channel as well as the source to enable this. 80 millivolts per decade performance. It was compared to equivalent 7 nanometer FinFET devices and provided some surprising results. Firstly, any device this much in research isn't going to be ready for prime time anytime soon. Regular transistors have had 50 years of development. These new transistors have not. So at an equivalent voltage where a FinFET could run at 1 gigahertz, this tunnel FET would run at 0.7 megahertz. That's over a thousand times slower. However, at that voltage, the static power of a billion transistors is only 0.22 microwatts, compared to 1.54 watts of the FinFETs. That's a factor difference of over 7 million. Due to these features, the research paper modeled the transistor as part of a digital neuromorphic chip and compared it against known models of modern neuromorphic chips. The research groups behind this design are actually involved in neuromorphic research, hence the focus on something super low power. And researchers from Intel's neuromorphic team were also involved in this research. Neuromorphic chip power consumption is usually measured by an activity factor, as in how regularly a neuron is used or fired. At low activity, the new 2D tunnel FET showcased several thousand times lower power per neuron fired. Now there are a couple of barriers to high volume adoption here, as you might expect with any early research technology. Even though the paper states that standard manufacturing methods have their limitations, standard manufacturing methods are used, more often not, because they can scale and create millions of chips per day. The techniques to create these type of transistors are specialized, especially when using 2D materials such as the molybdenum disulfide or tungsten ditelluride. Lots of research is going on today to even manufacture those on standard 300 millimeter wafers for use with standard CMOS manufacturing methods. Another limitation is cost. Low volume parts will be higher 
uh, higher cost to manufacture. And one of the benefits of the current generation of mass production technology is that it has had 50 to 70 years of optimization put into it. One of the things I love about what I do is the ability to look at what's new. What's the latest and greatest? It's why I spend a lot of time talking about the latest generation of chips for CPUs, for AI, or specialist compute. It's great that we can build on the foundational technologies that we have got to where we are today. However, if we can find new foundations with less restrictive limits to help the future evolve faster and the better and good for all, then it's worth keeping an eye out for potential routes for better hardware. In my discussions with legendary chip architect Jim Keller, he is always an advocate for rebuilding the foundations of an architecture as often as possible. Design something good, then get the low-hanging fruit in the next generation, then start again with a fresh sheet of paper. It allows you to reset your baseline time and time again. In land of transistors, we're doing that with planar transistors to finfets, finfets to nano ribbons or gate all around. And then in the future, we have fork sheets and stacked transistors on that roadmap as well. But fundamentally changing our physics, perhaps we need to do that sometime soon.